Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, the Federal Society for Law and Public Policy Studies is founded on the principle that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of powers is essential to our constitution, and it is duty and province of judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. I am very pleased to introduce Mr. John Bond to our law school community today. Mr. Bond is a columnist for the Wall Street Journal and it's opinionjournal.com and only a contributor to 24-hour cable news networks, CNBC and MSNBC. He is the author of several books, including Stealing Elections, How Voter Fraud Threatens Our Democracy, and The Dangers of Regulation Through Litigation. Mr. Fung joined the Wall Street Journal in 1984 as a deputy features editor and became an editorial page writer specializing in politics two years later. He worked as a research analyst for the California legislature in Sacramento before beginning his journalism career in 1982 as a reporter for the syndicated columnists Roland Evans and Robert Dubeck. In 1993, he received Warren's Books Award for Journalist Excellence from American Legislative Exchange Council. Mr. Fung attended California State University where he studied journalism and economics. I'm also very grateful for Professor Robert Bennett for offering comments today. Professor Bennett is a scholar in the field of constitutional law and Northwestern. Professor Bennett has been a member of faculty since 1989, 1969, 69. excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> trying to make you look younger. Uh, I, I wish you could do it. <laughs> and he served as the school dean from 1985 to 1995. Since 2002, he has been the Nathaniel L. Dayton's Professor of Law in Northwestern. Professor Bennett teaches a seminar in the Law of American Democracy and courses in contract, legislation, constitutional law, and constitutional theory. He has also taught as visiting professor at other law schools, including UVA, USC, Brooklyn Law School, and Yeshiva University. Please join me in welcoming our guest speakers. Thank you. I've spoken at Northwestern before and enjoyed the wonderful facilities you have here and uh, very good audiences. My only question is, before when I spoke here, I didn't have the entire front row completely vacated all the way to the back wall. So I have two plausible explanations for this. One is on one of my previous speeches here, got around that somehow I must expectorate, and therefore if you sat in the front row, you'd get a shower. Or uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, so controversial that you want to be at a safe distance when you throw things at people. <laughs> but there are other, perhaps other explanations of sociological bent that we can figure out uh, in the question and answer session, which I look forward to. I, um, it's also very fitting that uh, I discuss uh, issues of uh, political corruption and voter fraud in Chicago. Uh, Chicago, as you know, has a storied history. Uh, let's just say that uh, I when, when the Obama administration came from Chicago, it brought a whole lot of people with it. Uh, they created the, what is called the 51st Ward. It's the White House. And uh, much of what I'm going to try to do is locally based, but I'm going to try to link it to recent events and also national events, including those in Washington involving the Obama administration. And I know that it was advertised that I'd be discussing term limits. I've written a book on term limits. I have much to say about that, but we'll probably save that for the question and answers as much as possible. So, voter fraud. Probably the most interesting change since the 1960 presidential election in which voter fraud played a major and significant role in the debate about the outcome of that election, which was at that time one of the closest in American history, and a lot of that hinged on, shall we say, controversial vote totals in the city of Chicago. Much has changed in those last 50 years. One thing that has changed is there has been a general sense that voter fraud no longer occurs, uh, especially among elite opinion, that this is not something that is really a major concern, um, its incidence is very low, and frankly, we don't have to worry about it. Well, I'm going to excuse that. Let's look at not elite opinion, but at opinion of average voters, the people we depend upon to turn out and support our democracy. 
In 2008, two polls came, three polls came out, a Rasmussen Report Survey, uh, a Zogby poll, and a Gallup poll. I'll just use uh, the Rasmussen Survey, which found that 17% of Americans believe that large numbers of legitimate voters are prevented from voting through voter intimidation and for other means they are discouraged from voting. A larger number, 25%, believe that large numbers of ineligible people are allowed to vote or votes are cast that shouldn't be cast. That means that over two out of five Americans effectively believe that our elections may not be fully free and fair. That's a large number of Americans. And if you look at uh, polls of voter cynicism, uh, one of the things you find is in states that have a long and, shall we say, storied uh, connection to voter fraud, you often have difficulty getting high voter turnout. So I believe that there is a connection. Now, in addition, we have a, a president, President Obama, who has a long and interesting history with this issue. Uh, he has taught constitutional law at the University of Chicago. Uh, his most frequent classes that he taught were on voting rights. And this is what he said uh, back in 2007. Both parties at different periods in our history have been guilty of election crimes either preventing people from voting or skewing election results for tactical advantage. We should be beyond that. And I agree, whether it's voter intimidation or voter fraud, uh, this is something that eats away at our democracy and we should be concerned about it. We have two civil rights at stake when it comes to voting. One is that we should make special efforts not to return to our unfortunate past in which Many people were prevented from voting, intimidated from voting. There were artificial barriers to voting, whether they were overly complex tests or poll taxes. And we fought a great civil rights struggle in the 1960s to mitigate those harms. And we need to preserve and ensure those gains. But there is another civil right, which is each and every one of you have the right not to have your vote canceled out by someone who shouldn't be voting, someone who's voting twice, someone who's ineligible to vote, uh, someone who doesn't even exist. In other words, you have a civil right not to have your vote canceled out through manipulation, incompetence at the, po at the polling place, or through other manipulation. And for those who believe that we only have to focus on the first civil right and not the second civil right, I'll just give you two examples which are taken from events less than a week old and in states that I picked because they were close to Illinois. I could give you examples all over the country. By the way, just as a note of clarification, I do not believe that human nature is structured such that there is a monopoly on virtue residing in any political party. I believe the temptations of political office, the temptations of political power are such that you will find vote fraud in every political party and across all groups. Now, having said that, we used to have a lot more Republican vote fraud. We used to have big city machines that were dominated by Republicans. Uh, Chicago, until the 1930s, was a Republican machine. Al Capone bought off officials in a Republican machine. Philadelphia was run by a Republican machine until 1950. Uh, there are other examples. The most recent Republican machine, uh, which has fallen on hard times, was Al D'Amato's Nassau County machine in Long Island, where among other interesting ethical practices, 2% uh, of the salary of every county worker had to go to the political party that appointed him to the patronage position. Now, most of those Republican machines have fallen by the wayside. Uh, they no longer exist, and those were often the breeding grounds for, for vote fraud or vote corruption. It doesn't mean that voter intimidation doesn't go on. It doesn't mean that either party still uh, participates in this, uh, often at an individual level, not in an organized party sense. But there's probably much less Republican Party vote fraud for the structural reasons that I just mentioned than there used to be. Although I can still take you to counties in the hollows of Kentucky where Republican Party local machines uh, will buy a vote and the price has gone up from one-fifth of whiskey to a gallon in recent years. In fact, one of my two examples uh, comes from Kentucky. Clay County, Kentucky, which is just south of the Illinois line uh, in the, uh, off of the, in the uh, Paducah area, you had a judge, a county judge, convicted and sentenced last week to 26 years in prison. Now, 
eyes popped up because this rarely happens in voter fraud cases. Usually it's just suspended sentence and community service. 26 years in prison. He apparently had masterminded a scheme involving absentee ballots in Kentucky that involved stealing 8,000 votes in a single election. And apparently he had 19 co-conspirators and almost all of them have gone to trial and sentenced as well. This is a judge. Then we move to Michigan, which is, doesn't border Illinois, but it's close enough. In Michigan last week, we had two people indicted. In Oakland County, which is 1.2 million people, it's the fourth wealthiest county in America, over, over a population over a million. And what was their crime, or alleged crime? The former head of the Democratic Party in Oakland and the former director of operations for the Democratic Party in Oakland were indicted on 37 counts of felony forgery and manipulation of election laws relating to creating a fake key party. Uh, basically, not only going out and finding candidates so ostensibly to run for the Tea Party, even though they had, had no thought of doing so, but collecting signatures in massive amounts that were fraudulent or duplicates, and then submitting them to try to get a Tea Party on the ballot to drain votes away from the other political party, and presumably gave them an advantage of the election. Uh, they have contested the charges, but they will be going to trial. Those are just two examples from the last week to show that I still think that we have a problem in this area. Now, I don't think we have, given prosecutorial discretion, um, enough emphasis on this crime. And I'll tell you why. I've talked to a lot of prosecutors, I've talked to former US attorneys. They hate vote fraud cases. Why do they hate vote fraud cases? Well, most prosecutors have some political component to their job. They're either elected uh, in a political contest or they have political bosses to answer to. And they hate voter fraud cases because no matter who they go after, they're going to get half the political establishment mad at them. If they go after Republicans, they're going to get uh, Republicans mad at them. If they go after Democrats, they're going to get Democrats mad at them. These cases almost always go to the bottom of the stack. Uh, an, an overwhelming burden of proof is required. Almost literally have to hand them the evidence on a silver platter. And of course, there's the racial component. Uh, if there's any hint uh, that ethnic minorities are involved in this activity, uh, the cry of racism will immediately be raised, and many people, frankly, are still intimidated about that, even prosecutors. Now, having given you a couple of examples, um, let's move to a discussion of how this issue is treated at the national level. And here we have an interesting case. President Obama is an expert on voting rights. As I said, he taught classes at the University of Chicago on this. but. He has a much more interesting and rich political history. When he moved to Chicago in the late 1980s and became a community organizer with various neighborhood groups in the city, uh, his first real job, as in having direct responsibility over a project, was with a group called Project Vote. And that was the group that in 1991 registered something like 136,000 people um, in Chicago and surrounding environs and based radically increased voter registration. And that contributed to the defeat of Senator Alan Dixon in 1992, which you might remember he lost to Carol Mosley Brown, uh, who was a senator for just one term. Um, mistakes were made on her part. Um, let's just say that uh, you could walk through some of her most uh, carefully well thought out uh, ethical decisions and not get your ankles wet. <coughs> So she was elected in part due to the voter registration efforts uh, of Barack Obama. And we don't know, because there wasn't an audit or anything like that, we don't know the extent to which there were duplicates or other issues there. But we do know this, Barack Obama did such a good job in that voter registration drive that he became the top trainer for the organization that basically was affiliated with and directly responsible for Project Vote, and that was a group called ACORN, which you might have heard about. ACORN made him their top trainer for their seminars. ACORN was so pleased with his work on the training programs that they then, he then became the lead lawyer for a very important case, uh, a voting rights case in Illinois. And here's the background. In 1993, the first law passed by the Democratic Congress under Bill Clinton was uh, the Motor Voter Law. This was a federal mandate that said all states had to basically adopt postcard registration which meant that rather than go through perhaps more cumbersome registration procedures, you, all states would have to provide people with an opportunity to fill out 
mailbox, <coughs> a postcard, drop from the mailbox, and be automatically registered to vote. Governor Jim Edgar, who was the Republican governor in Illinois at the time, said this was an un undue burden on the states because there was no money attached to this, and he uh, refused to enforce it. So ACORN and various other groups filed suit in federal court, and they, the lead lawyer was Barack Obama, who said that there was an overwhelming uh, public interest in having uh, access to the ballot box, and the motor voter law should be held constitutional, and he won in federal court. That was the case that had the most precedential value in making sure that motor voters spread around the rest of the country. Now, I'm not here to litigate or argue about the motor voter law, but just to say that Barack Obama was central to its implementation. Then in uh, 2002, we had an update to the motor voter law, because one of the things we learned because of this postcard registration device is an awful lot of voter registration rules became clogged with deadwood. These are people who had moved away from the state, people who were no longer eligible, uh, people who uh, had died, all kinds of reasons. The deadwood in North Carolina reached 22%, the deadwood in Illinois reached 14% uh, estimated, and there was clearly a problem. So after the disputed 2000 recount in Florida between Bush and Gore, there was an attempt to clean up our election laws. And HAVA, which is the Help America Vote Act, was passed. HAVA had many provisions, but one of them was uh, a federal mandate that states had to clean up their voter rolls. They had to continue to provide easy access to the registration process, but they also had to clean up the rolls. And there was federal money attached to it to actually do that. As Senator Chris Dodd, who's the leading Democratic co-sponsor of the law, said, the purpose of this law is to make it easy to vote and harder to cheat. And I do believe that in many states, we now have a cleaner registration process <coughs> as a result of that. So that's the background. Now we fast forward to um, the spring, summer, and fall of 2008, the presidential election. Barack Obama has, until about 2005 and 2006, given all kinds of speeches to ACORN groups, appeared at their national convention, gave various quotes, which I could recite to you about how we have all stood shoulder to shoulder and participated in so many projects together. But when he started to run for president, he became strangely silent about ACORN and basically wouldn't, wouldn't answer any questions about it. Well, the campaign was asked repeatedly, are his old friends at ACORN involved in the campaign? Repeatedly, the statement was, no, they were not. Well, finally, late in the fall of 2008, we learned that uh, during the critical debate, the critical primary caucus, primary contest with Hillary Clinton in Pennsylvania and Ohio, a subsidiary of ACORN uh, was hired for voter registration and outreach efforts in those states by the Barack Obama campaign. But it was a subsidiary, and it's when you fill out in the FEC, you have to say to what the vendor uh, is hired the company to do, and here it was staging, lighting, and roadshow activities. Uh, basically sounded as if they were doing a rock concert promotion or something like that. Well, it turns out, no, they were doing voter registration and other activities. And the money was substantial. It was about $900,000. Well, in the summer of 2008, we had a series of scandals involving ACORN. Uh, the, the, clear, the clearest scandal was in Nevada, where a Democratic Attorney General and the Democratic Secretary of State and the Democratic Registrar of Voters in Las Vegas decided that what ACORN was doing in Nevada was a crime and a scandal because they were clearly registering a whole bunch of people who were not eligible to vote or simply manufacturing names. And ACORN had a previous bad record in Washington State where an injunction had been issued against them by the prosecutors in Seattle saying there's a long list of things in this consent decree you're not supposed to do in the future. Well, they were doing precisely that in Nevada and a whole range of other states, which I could rattle off. But in Nevada, it got so bad that they finally had the FBI raid ACORN's offices and car off the computers, and they indicted several people. What they later found was that ACORN had gotten a lot of its people to do the registration efforts from a work release program in a local prison. In fact, they seemed to focus on a particular type of person in this work release program, people who had been convicted of identity theft crimes. In other words, they were hiring specialists. <laughs> because this was rather sophisticated fraud that they were trying to do. And now admittedly, some of it, I'm sure, was done on an individual level. Uh, I'm sure there were some people, because ACORN paid by the voter registration card, 
that uh, you know, wanted to make easy money, so they would go into a public library and copy down names from the phone book or whatever. I'm sure some of that. But in, but in Nevada, the eight court officials were indicted. And the eight court officials were indicted on charges of felony, on charges of forgery and various other activities and uh, obstructing justice. So, and eventually, by the way, they pled out to community service and other relatively minor uh, punishments. At this point, because it was estimated that overall in the country about 30% of acorn registrations were fraudulent, at this point there was a hue and cry for an investigation. Well, the Bush Justice Department wasn't particularly interested in this. Uh, they were leaving office. Uh, the request went to the Obama Justice Department. Uh, it's curious because acorn is clearly an organization that was closely attached to the winning presidential candidate, but there was no investigation. Uh, much less a special prosecutor point to look into this. So then we fast forward to two, later in 2009, and then we have the infamous videos, which have nothing to do with voter fraud, but I'm sure you've probably heard about the Acorn videos. Uh, some of them are still in dispute as to whether or not they were selectively edited, but the bottom line is, in all but one office that these uh, provocateurs, cinematic provocateurs visited, in all but one office, they, were, they had people cooperate with them on trying to evade detection of what the provocateurs claimed was an illegal child prostitution ring. And ultimately it led to the firing of a bunch of people and it led to Congress within 10 days, bipartisan vote with Al Franken joining in, believe it or not, uh, Al Franken joining in to defund ACORN. Uh, ACORN said this was an illegal bill of attainder and they challenged it in federal court and didn't, that didn't get anywhere. ACORN effectively collapsed uh, under the own weight of its uh, mismanagement, lack of oversight, and corruption. Well, that takes me to the Obama Justice Department, where I'll conclude. The Obama Justice Department has had several opportunities to reorient enforcement of civil rights and voting rights laws. Uh, there was contention, which I don't think is borne out by the statistics, but perhaps you have more updated information. There was contention that the Bush administration wasn't interested in pursuing voting rights cases. Uh, actually, I think the Bush administration held up fairly well. It had other problems. It had Alberto Gonzalez, who frankly was one of the most incompetent attorneys general we've ever had in our country's history. And there was politicization of the Justice Department. There was the famous case of people for career slots, the Justice Department being interviewed on the basis of whether or not they supported the particular political causes. But when we go to the Obama Justice Department, we see some curious things happening. I don't have to go into the new Black Panther case. You've probably heard enough about that. Uh, there are competing reports. There's an Inspector General's report. I'm sorry, not an Inspector General's report. There's an internal report from within the Obama Justice Department saying there was no particular problem. And there's, all, but there's also a report from the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights which says there was a pervasive cover-up, uh, stonewalling, and a refusal to answer basic questions, and that the U.S. Civil Rights Commission issued 17 separate subpoenas to the Justice Department, which ignored all 17 of them. They wouldn't send anybody, they wouldn't call, they wouldn't write, they wouldn't cooperate. Uh, so much for transparency. But leaving aside that case, there was a more interesting case, which is, go back to HAVA, which is the Help America Vote Act, which says the federal government has a responsibility to request that the states clean up their voter rolls. Well, it turned out a lot of the states have not done so. Uh, in Missouri, for example, you had something like one-third of the counties had more registrations on the books than there were the census had recorded as adults over the age of 18 in the last census. When you have more people registered than you have adults over the age of 18, you potentially have a problem because that amount of voter registration haphazard accounting can make it, can facilitate voter fraud. So the request to the Secretary of State of Missouri was clean up your act. This was made in the last year, I'm sorry, 2005. Uh, it wanted its way through courts. There were you know, motions, there were stays, there were a whole range of things, there were delays. Anyway, the case was on track to be won because Missouri was still fighting the federal government demanding that it clean up its voter rolls. And then in May 2009, the new Obama administration, after four years of litigation, decided to drop the case suddenly with almost no explanation. And in November of 2009, there was a meeting of top Justice Department officials, and there, uh, a top Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, um, Julie Fernandez, was reported to have said, 
we are no longer going to enforce or bring any suits under this provision of the Voting Rights Act, or I'm sorry, OHAVA, because we are only interested in pursuing increased access at the polls. We are not increased, interested in any cases whatsoever that potentially could decrease access to the polls. In other words, we're not going to pay attention to this part of the law. Uh, this was reported by a uh, career <coughs> Justice Department official who had, did have conservative leanings, but he was in a career slot. He attended that lunch. There was corroboration from others, including Christopher Coates, who was the former head of the voting rights section of the Civil Rights Division. And he has won awards from the NAACP, he has won awards from various other people. He was transferred out of his post by the Obama administration, sent to Charleston, South Carolina, in the form of PERDA. And he finally has left the Justice Department. He testified before the U.S. Civil Rights Commission that all of this was the case and was rather embittered by his experience in the Obama Justice Department, which he said was fun, had a fundamentally different approach to enforcing the law than the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and previous administrations. So we come now to even more present day. I'll just leave you with one more example. There's a small town, Kinston, North Carolina. It's a town of about 16,000 people, and it has roughly 70% African American population, 30% everyone else. And there are 300 municipalities in North Carolina. There are exactly three who use have municipal elections along the following lines. Uh, 297 municipalities roughly in North Carolina elect on a nonpartisan basis. Three elect on a partisan basis. In other words, when you vote for city council, you vote for Democrat or Republican, vegetarian, libertarian, whatever. Kinston decided that it wanted to change its voting procedures. And they had a referendum on this, city referendum. It passed with 69% of the vote. There were 11 precincts in Kinston that had a majority black population. It passed at eight of them. So they then, because the Voting Rights Act requires preclearance, and North Carolina is a preclearance state because of historical iniquities uh, relating to discrimination, it has to send any changes in election laws up to Washington to, for preclearance by the Justice Department. The Justice Department turned them down, turned them down flat. And the explanation, uh, I don't have a quote directly in front of me, but it's a very strong paraphrase. The explanation was that the identifier of the political party was necessary so that the majority population of Kingston would know which candidates it should vote for in order to be properly represented. I can find the exact quote in here, but I don't, that's basically it. In other words, you need the partisan tag in order to tell people who to vote for, which I think is an interesting interpretation of how people should be prompted to vote, uh, or whether they need that. And there was a big hue and cry. There were calls for oversight hearings, which have yet to be held. But to this day, uh, I find this a very, very important interpretation of the Voting Rights Act, and frankly, one that the Obama administration actually won't further defend, other than that one statement by one of the officials in charge of the Voting Rights Division. They have refused to comment, refused to for issue further explanations about it. But it still stands. Kingston could have sued to try to overturn it, but the cost of litigation apparently were very large for a town of 16,000, and they ended up deciding to drop it. So Kingston wanted to change its election law, but it was not able to. Now all of this is just scratching the surface. I can give you many other examples. My point here is this. We have a long, tangled, and unfortunate history in this country when it comes to voting, when it comes to race, and when it comes to access to the ballot box. And I fully understand the need for hypersensitivity in this area. This is a core civil right. This is a core right. But enforcement is very, very important that it be conducted in a way that is viewed as impartial and affects everyone. And here I think we have some concerns. Under the Bush administration, there was a case of Nuxobe County, Mississippi. It turns out that this was a political machine in Nuxobe. Now, 50 years ago, there was a political machine in Nuxobe, and it was run by white Jim Crow segregationists. And they made darn sure certain people didn't vote. Well, fast forward. By the 1990s, we had a new political machine in Nuxobe. It was run by a guy named Ike Brown. Ike Brown happened to be African American. And I, Ike Brown made sure that two kinds of people didn't get elected in his county. Whites and blacks weren't with the program. And he made darn sure that none of them ever got elected. He ran a political machine in which there literally was testimony about Ike Brown coming in and ordering election workers 
to recount absentee votes and make until they had the right result. There was, there was clear evidence, uh, witnesses, affidavits, Dyke Brown had, had made racial comments about how people shouldn't be allowed to vote, shouldn't have certain votes counted. It was an amazing case. And finally, a federal judge had to address this. He basically took the extraordinary step of decertifying Ike Brown as the chairman of the Democratic Party in Nuxobi, putting in a special master to uh, uh, administer the elections. And to this day, and I think Nuxobi you know, is still under a special master for having its elections held. And Mr. Brown granted and raved and cried racism, but ultimately he was taken out of office. When the Obama administration came in, one of the things that people in the career, depart career department of the voting rights section were told is there will be no more Nuxobis, and there's affidavits on this as well. In other words, as one person was rumored to have said, this is not an affidavit, we, the civil rights law is all, the voting rights law is all about making sure that oppressed minorities have their rights maintained and expanded. It is not about using it to support people in the power structure. And again, this is an interesting case of selective enforcement, if it's true. So my point is this. We have these two civil rights, and I think we've made measurable progress, although we have to continue to monitor this and expand this, we've made measurable progress in making sure that the voter intimidation, the poll taxes, and the other tactics of bygone era aren't perpetuated today under more sophisticated or more subtle forms, and that certainly can and has happened in recent years. But there's the other civil right, which is making sure that whether you're white or black, or pink or yellow or whatever, those, the laws are enforced also when it comes to your potential violations. And the voter fraud, which by the way, affects people not just between the political parties, Democrat versus Republican, the most outraged comments on voter fraud that I've ever heard were from the reform candidates for mayor in places like Detroit and St. Louis, when the, when the black political machine crushed them because they represented a minority of the minority community in that area, and they wanted to take over and tackle the machine. And frankly, in some of those races, I think they probably would have won absent voter fraud. I point you to the city of Detroit. The candidate who won that election, Juan Nicole Patrick, ultimately went to federal prison probably would have been much better for the city of Detroit and much better for the citizens of Michigan and much better for the reputation of Detroit if that election was looked at. And by the way, the registrar of voters in Detroit was office was so corrupt and or incompetent it had to be taken over by the state of Michigan. It had to be literally seized and taken over by the state of Michigan. So my point is this. We have these two civil rights. Let's enforce both of them. Because only through balanced enforcement can we have the rule of law maintained. You know, there was a famous uh, poem called The Incredible Bread Machine about an entrepreneur who was persecuted and sent to prison by the federal government. The details shouldn't concern you, but at the sentencing, this entrepreneur appears before the judge and asks, why is this being done to me? The law is being traduced. And the judge looks down her nose at him and says, in complex times, we find the rule of law deficient. We much prefer the rule of men. It's vastly more efficient. So, just as there have always been scandals in Justice Departments of both political parties, I think we have a brewing and incipient scandal in the Obama administration's Justice Department. At least we have troubling signs that it's tending in one direction. And there has not been sufficient coverage of this in the mainstream media. I recognize that, but frankly there should be. And with that, I will be happy to take your questions on this and or term limits or other issues. Thank you.
the scenario or play out the scenario that he's concerned about, but I certainly understand the, the temptation of politics in the, uh, uh, in the government structure, uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a problem that requires constant attention. Uh, the press is probably the, the vehicle for giving it that attention. Uh, I, I would only point out that there are uh, two structural problems that complicate uh, the reform agenda that Mr. Fund uh, has in mind. Um, one is the extraordinary localness of election administration in the United States. Um, the, there are some federal statutes, but the constitutional scheme is grounded on qualifications to vote being decided on a state-by-state -state basis and administration of uh, the voting process uh, being grounded on state uh, administration. And the states uh, very frequently uh, then pass it off to local administrations uh, as a part of quote, the state scheme. Um, so uh, that makes uh, the development of sort of uniform standards very difficult, uh, probably impossible, and complicates any enforcement process, even enforcement process uh, that is uh, situated in, in Washington. The second uh, structural problem is the tension between the two uh, voting problems that Mr. Fund adverted to and had Senator Dodd adverting to. Uh, we got to make sure that everybody who's entitled to vote uh, gets to vote uh, and that nobody who's not entitled to vote uh, gets uh, to vote. Um, uh, one can hardly disagree with uh, both of those aims, but they are in some tension with one another. So if you have a rigorous uh, attempt to make sure that there's access to the polls as by this uh, postcard uh, device and the like, you raise the danger that there will be uh, misrepresentations uh, uh, included in the process and vice versa. So I think those are two structural problems. They, that doesn't mean that they uh, can't be attended to uh, simultaneously, but they do tend to get in the way of, of uh, each other. Um, uh, I only uh, uh, then uh, end with uh, an example of my own experience in voting. I vote quite faithfully, um, uh, uh, but almost always when I go to the polls to vote, uh, I have forgotten to bring my voter registration card because I don't carry it around with me always. I usually am able to get by the officials there even without it. Um, uh, often on the basis of my signature, but any of you who've seen my signature know that it is uh, entirely illegible uh, these days. It used to be absolutely impeccable. I wrote in third grade, I was commissioned to write the handwriting lessons on the board because I had such exquisite handwriting. Well, it's deteriorated over the years. And when I registered to vote, it was more like my third grade. Uh, signature than it is like today's signature. So sometimes I get some problems there. Uh, I also recently received an email from a friend of mine urging me to vote for the alderman in the 43rd Ward that he was a candidate that he's uh, backing in the, uh, in the upcoming uh, election. Uh, and I had to write him back and say, as I only recently learned actually, I no longer am in the 43rd Ward. It's not because I've moved, it's because the boundaries of the 43rd Ward have moved. They in fact run down the middle of the street on which I live. So that if I lived across the street, I'd be in the 43rd Ward, but I'm not in the 43rd Ward. So I don't even know, I'm not always confident what, where I'm supposed to vote or for what offices I'm supposed to vote. And that's in part an example of the sort of extraordinary locality, localness of uh, the administration of the rules uh, that govern uh, how it is these elections are to be conducted. So um, um, 
I'll stop there and only say thank you to Mr. Fun for um, providing some instruction for me and I hope for the rest of you. But let him ask, sure. answer uh, some questions if you have. I don't have my contact lenses on, so if anyone's raised their hand, I may not be able to see them. I think I think I see <laughs> in the white shirt. That much I can see. Okay. Um, it seems to me as if the biggest potentiality for mass voter fraud is from the illegal immigrant population because it's so large and it's so obviously illegal for them to vote. Um, and it seems like it could tip elections, certainly in, in some states. So can you talk about whether there's any real evidence of this occurring, or if not, maybe why not? M much less evidence than one would think. Um, I know a lot of conservatives get hyperactive about illegal alien voting, but there are far fewer examples of it now for two reasons. One is, ra rather than have individual cases, if, if a campaign or a party wants to steal an election, it has to have a certain amount of organization behind it. It's usually not hundreds of random individual acts in which people don't talk to each other. It's very difficult to organize illegal aliens for obvious reasons. In addition, illegal aliens tend to want to avoid contact with the government. In other words, there's always the fear, even though it's not real, that you know, la emigración will stop you as you leave a polling place. So it's actually much less of a problem than I think a lot of conservatives tout or claim. Now having said that, there are examples. Um, the Attorney General of Texas, Greg Abbott, has indicted several vote brokers along the border counties in Texas who go door to door uh, harvesting absentee ballots. They show up at people's doors, steps, and if they're an old friend, they will simply explain, I'm here again to help you fill out your ballot, and by the way, uh, you know, your fence needs painting. Uh, would you like someone to go paint, paint your fence tomorrow? That kind of thing. Sometimes cash is used, but apparently it's usually favors being traded. If it's a new prospect, it is explained to them that we have a Nueva Forma de Votar, we have a new way of voting, which is we are so service oriented, we will send this campaign volunteer over to your house and they will help you fill out your absentee ballot and they will deliver it for you. So there are examples where that happens, but I do not think it's a pervasive problem and I think it's one of the least of our problems when it comes to voting. Yes? What about homeless voter registration? Um, that seems like a much more rich area, in my opinion, in terms of the fact that these people theoretically do have the right to vote to begin with. Well, they do have the right to vote. There are lots of court cases which show that you don't have to have a residence, a domicile. Having said that, um, if you're going to have the homeless vote, you probably shouldn't have what six or seven states, including Wisconsin, have, which is same-day voter registration. Same-day voter registration is an engraved invitation to voter fraud because it means you can show up at a polling place. In Wisconsin, you need to show no ID, none. You can show up at the polling place and you can register to vote, and you can vote right there on the spot. Now, in theory, you're supposed to have someone with you who lives in the neighborhood who vouches for you. These people are easily procured, by the way, usually at the door, at the end, you enter the place. And about probably 40% of the polling workers never even ask for that. Now, the problem is, we actually know how much this is a scandal. Milwaukee Police Department did a 76-page report on the problems in the 2004 election, which documented dozens and dozens and dozens of cases with names of people who had temporarily moved into Wisconsin as campaign workers and had left the day after the election, who registered and voted, people who were bussed up from Illinois, who showed up and registered to vote, voted and were bussed back to Illinois. College students, there, were, there was a story in the Marquette University College newspaper in which at least eight students boasted that they had voted more than once. As soon as this was reported to the district attorney, they suddenly had a different <laughs> recollection. But this 76-page police report is a law enforcement document, and it details the problems that you can have. If you have homeless people and you have same-day voter registration, you have a real problem. In 2000, there was a Park Avenue heiress who showed up in Milwaukee to turn out votes for a presidential candidate, and her practice was to go to places where the homeless congregated and offer them free packs of cigarettes if they would board a bus and go vote in multiple locations. Now, 
this rather struck people as rather bizarre. I'm sure that Al Gore had nothing to do with this because of Al Gore is an anti-smoking crusader. Uh, but certainly <laughs> the people who were supporting it had an interesting inducement to try to get these people to vote. It wasn't cash, it was cigarettes. Which, so I think there were two crimes there, one a moral crime and one a legal crime. <laughs> yes? Um, I moved to Chicago a few, a few years ago. And, from where? Uh, from Skokie, which is the northern suburbs. Sure. But be that as it may. Um, for the election this past year, I thought about changing my voter registration so I could vote here. The reason I didn't was because this is Chicago, and my family is long-term Chicagoans. And my thought was that my voter registration would remain on the books, even if I asked them to take it off. I didn't expect that they would, and it would potentially be used to perpetrate vote fraud ad infinitum. Um, so I wanted to ask you um, how plausible you think that is. I, I, I'm not running for office, so I can utter three words that almost no one in Washington ever says. I don't know. <laughs> Having said that, I would speculate but it's only speculation. There's a fellow named James Lasky, who's here in Chicago. He used to be the second ranking city official. He was the city clerk, I think two or three terms. Well, he had difficulties with some um, money changing hands of small amounts, and he was eventually indicted and prosecuted and sent to federal public housing for a short period of time. <laughs> and he came out and he's written a book, uh, you can find it on the web, about his experiences in the Daily Machine in Chicago. And he recalls that his first brush with voter fraud in Daily Chicago was when he had a summer job, that it was a patronage summer job, in college with the Daily Machine. And this was a really neat job because he didn't have to show up for it. This is a really good job. It was well paid and you didn't have to show up for it. I mean, you had to punch in every once in a while. You had to you know, come by the office and wave or whatever. But you, it was a great job. So in, in November, he votes in an election. And then the next spring, he waits around to get the job again. And it turns out he didn't get the job. So finally, he goes to his local alderman, whatever <coughs> ward it was, and says, you know, hey, I'm looking forward to that job. You know, my, uh, my parents, you know, have been loyal members of the machine. You know, what, what, what's wrong? And the guy said, oh, you, Lasky. Yeah, we know all about you. Well, what do you mean? Well. You're in college now, aren't you? Yeah. So you're you're, you're down state in college, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that means you voted absentee, right? Yeah, I didn't vote absentee. Yeah, we know all about you. Well, what do you mean? He says, uh, so who'd you vote for for uh, who'd you vote for for Cook County Sheriff? Uh, I don't remember. Well, I know. You voted for the wrong guy. We don't allow one mistake here. Sorry, no job. Now, that was a long time ago, 30 years ago, but it's instructive. Could I, could I uh, just get a word in about that? I, uh, I haven't thought about it before you asked it, but my hunch would be that there's relatively little danger, um, if I understand the question that's put. And here's my reasoning. Um, there are two ways in which your name when you no longer were living in Chicago might be used if you remained on the books. One would be to have a person come in and attempt to claim to be you. And that seems to me it's rare. very rare. It is very rare. unlikely because it requires such a mobilization of manpower in order to harvest the votes that way. The second way would be to have the officials at the polling put in ballots in your name and other names, and that would be an efficient way to harvest fraudulent votes. But I, my hunch is that they've got lots of people who are registered and living there who don't come in to vote. Right. And so at the end of the day, they've got all sorts of possibilities if this is what they're going to try to do. Now, obviously, there are dangers in trying to do that. You could get caught. But Need to, but for those reasons, I would think that the particular danger you worried about was not something that you should be overly concerned about. By the way, there is less voter fraud in Chicago than there used to be. Uh, a grand jury uh, was impaneled. This was about the time that they had the famous bar incident where the feds opened up a fake bar in downtown Chicago to uh, 
around public yeah, officials. Yeah, yeah. As part of that, there was an investigation of voter fraud. It estimated that in 1982, where there was a very close race for governor in Illinois, it was decided by less than 10,000 votes, it was estimated by this grand jury that over 10% of the vote cast in the city of Chicago in 1982 in that governor's race was fraudulent, over 10%. Now, I think it's much less now, uh, both because the machine has become more sophisticated and because of mass media, there's, there's a lot more scrutiny and because of all kinds of uh, opportunities for people to leak and squeal and raise a ruckus. But uh, it still exists, but not nearly to the scale that it did 25 years ago. Yes? Uh, it seems to me the biggest problem with, with vote fraud and political issues is that people simply don't care. And the only people who do care are those who are convinced that the other side is cheating them. What do you think it might take for independent voters or massive voters to eventually care? Do you think that's a likelihood? Well, a lot of people do care, but they've stopped voting. In other words, this is cynical that I mentioned to you. I mean, there's 42% of people who either believe that people are blocking people from the polls or they're stealing votes, you know, either one. Uh, voter intimidation or voter fraud, that shows that there's at least a latent interest in the subject if people are prompted to think about it. Um, I think, frankly, we need to have a discussion about it. I think, frankly, we need to have uh, an understanding by both political parties that, uh, you know, human nature being what it is, both parties are prone to this. One may have more opportunity than the other. That doesn't mean that it's exclusively the province of one party. So I think some intellectual honesty has to start, which is when you have examples like the ones I cited, and that was just from the last week, at some point, it behooves people in office to say, okay, as Senator Dodd said, our goal should be to make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. In 2002, we had a rare coming together. It was a bipartisan compromise. The only way to pass an election bill was to meld the interests of one both parties, and you got, you know, both parties had to give up something, and both parties got something. We need another election bill. And it will, it, I guarantee you that if we get another election bill signed into law by whatever president it is, it will be something in which both parties give up something and both parties get something out of it. So we need another HAVA, frankly. And we need to address some of these concerns because HAVA, HAVA has basically, the biggest accomplishment HAVA has is it's, it's not revealed that we really do have a problem, especially in these 16 states, which have these enormous registration debt issues, and the federal government is doing nothing to enforce the law. Any other questions? You get a second one. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I remember the last time you uh, came here to speak, you talked about electronic voting machines for a little bit. Um, I wonder if there has been any improvement in them uh, recently. Deep old is, new, is under new management. <laughs> um, look, there are three issues about electronic voting machines that you need to know about. One is the simplest reason we have problems with electronic voting machines is this. They are not like your ATMs you get money from. How many of you, and be honest, how many of you, when you take money out of your ATM, you don't take the receipt or you throw it away, you don't look at it? In other words, you basically trust the machine that it deducted the proper amount of money from your account. How many of you don't? Okay, that, that's common, I don't do that. The problem with the electronic voting machine is, this is a low bid contract issue. We spend about one-tenth of what we spend on ATM machines for electronic voting machines and sometimes you get what you pay for. So we probably need to invest a little bit more. In mm -hmm. Per machine. Per machine, we spend about one-tenth of what an ATM costs. Now, that, that still means you can get a pretty good machine for less than an ATM. You don't need an ATM, which has incredible security. You know, it's built like a tank, you know, that kind of thing. But you still probably could do with more sophisticated and more reliable electronic voting machines. The second thing you need to know is, there are all these conspiracy theorists on both the right and the left to think that there's Manchurian computer programmers behind some curtain, you know, manipulating large blocks of votes. Well, two points. One, we have had a form of, com of electronic voting for the last 30 years. It's called punch card voting. You know, you punch the oval, it goes to a central location, it's counted by computer. We have had problems with punch cards. I'm sorry, but, no, I'm sorry, not punch Scratch that, punch cards with a disaster floor. Optical scan, you fill in the oval with a pencil, my mistake. We have had 30 years of experience with optical scan. We have never, even though they're counted by computers, we have never had a known example of those being manipulated in any sense of the word, uh, like you know, more than a straight sheet of here or there to alter an election. 
So it would be passing strange that for that form, we've had no experiences of widespread corruption. Suddenly for electronic voting machines, we would. Electronic voting machines, I think, conjure up you know, a black box. You know, you, you, your vote goes in, does it come out? Well, you can manipulate an electronic voting machine, but each machine is independent. They're not tied to each other. Unlike Venezuela, where Hugo Chavez makes sure that all the electronic voting machines are tied to a central election office, and the, any outcome of that is adjudicated by an election commission that he controls three to two, um, you do not have this in the decentralized system that the professor mentioned. We have a very localized system, and even within that localized system, one machine can't talk to the other machine. So in order to steal an election using electronic voting machines, you have to do hundreds of machines, dozens of machines. And that's a very complicated arrangement and require a lot of people being involved. Uh, the circle of suspects or collaborators would be very large indeed. You probably would be found out. And the last thing you didn't know about electronic voting machines is any, electric, any, any voting process has its problems. Electronic voting machines have some virtues that we don't often talk about. If you don't speak English, electronic voting machine can be programmed so easily for other languages. You know, it can be programmed with 50 languages if you want. Secondly, if you have bad eyesight, you can do the jumbo type immediately. It's much better for the visually impaired, much better for seniors. Uh, that's why the NAACP, although it's backtracked a little bit, the NAACP a few years ago passed a resolution endorsing electronic voting machines because they said they were the tool of choice for people in low-income neighborhoods, the elderly, and various other subgroups. So I think we often give them a bad rap uh, based on skimpy information. I think we should spend more money. The software can be manipulated. It's often, it often is uh, proprietary. It probably should be open source. So I agree that there are reforms that can be made, but I don't think there's wholesale manipulation of results by the kind of issue. With that, I think I've exhausted you. But thank you all for coming. I really much appreciate it.